Deuteronomy 2, 3. I want to talk to you about walking into what you're waiting for. I want to talk to you about walking into what you've been waiting for. We are not waiting for something. We are walking into something. Amen. I want you to get that down in your spirit. We are not waiting for something. We are walking into something. When we read in Acts 2, verse 40, uh, uh, the, toward the end of the chapter, it talks about how signs and wonders were taking place. Uh, the church was being added to daily such as should be saved. And we think that's what the outpouring of God looks like. But what we don't pay attention to is back in verse 42 where they were walking in some things. They weren't waiting on that and God dropped it on them like a big dollop of whipped cream. They were doing some very specific things. They were walking in some things and those things went like this. They were continuing in apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and prayers... And when they continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers, they walked themselves into an outcome. It wasn't just sitting back as though some magical, mystical moment when God decides everything's going to pay off for the church or for the people of God. They were committing to something. They determined to receive the words that were coming to them, not just as the words of their pastor or their chosen leader, but as apostolic doctrine over their life. They determined that they were going to walk in fellowship with one another and not just come look at the back of one another's head once a week. Come on now. And then they were willing to take fellowship a step further and let it become relationship. What's the difference between fellowship and relationship? When we're in fellowship, I'm ready to hold hands. When we have relationship, well then I'm ready to kiss. I'm ready to have something more. I'm willing for you to speak formatively in my life. I can hang out with you, but I'm not going to let you influence me. The difference between moving from fellowship is we can hang out with one another without killing each other. Hello. Amen. But then when we move into relationships, suddenly there's something more. Suddenly it's something that goes like this. I've got to have you in my life. Amen. And you're speaking formatively into my life. And I'm speaking formatively into your life. Where did they get that? Apostles' doctrine. Yeah. Fellowship. We quit fighting long enough to hear God do what He said. Yeah. And we moved into the breaking of bread. That was covenantal. It was more than juice and crackers. It was something covenantal that was taking place. And so it was apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread. And then as that be began to be generated in their midst and they began to be an apostolic community, you know what happened next? You do realize that the world was falling apart around them. They were under an occupying army. Civil war was breaking out. A man named Bar Kopa, who the Pharisees and the Sadducees were willing to call King of Kings and Lord of Lords when they had just crucified Jesus. They were fomenting rebellion and soon the blood would run ankle deep in the center of the city when the temple was destroyed. And during that time, there was such a detonation of God's favor that there were signs, there were miracles, there were wonders. Uh, the church was added to daily such as should be saved and there was not one single person in, the, in their midst that had any lack and anyone that had any, any surplus was distributing it like Barnabas, the son of consolation, and that the people of God were operating according to the economy of the kingdom when the economy of man was falling apart. And it wasn't because of who was in the Oval Office, but who was uh, uh, sitting as Lord on the throne of their hearts. Amen. 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 That's the truth. We're not waiting on something. God has given you an invitation to begin to walk into what we've been waiting on. Amen. In Deuteronomy 2.3, God spoke to Moses and to the children of Israel. He says, you have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn northward. <laughs> Where were they? 
If you look at verse 1 in Deuteronomy 2, it says they were in Mount Seir. Mount Seir is real interesting. If you look it up, you'll find that you and I are quite comfortable when, and we understand what Mount Seir is. You and I actually have an address there. And our, our mail gets forwarded there. Mount Seir means the rough place. <laughs> How many of you have compassed a mountain? How many of you have found yourself and they were encompassing it, round it? How many of you have found yourself going round and round and round with the rough place as a permanent spiritual geographical uh, uh, placement in your life? <laughs> the rough place. He said, you have compassed this mountain long enough. You've gone in circles around this mountain Long enough. It's one thing when you say enough is enough. It's another thing when God looks at what you're going through and He says, that'll be enough of that. Amen. And notice what He told him. How are we going to get out of the rough place? He said, turn you northward. See, if we're going to get out of the rough place, I, people all the time, they write in, they say, I'm in a stuck place. You can walk yourself into your own deliverance. Amen. And the key is found when we begin to understand what God means when He says, turn northward. Isaiah 14.3 says that God sits and God judges in the sides of the north. Did you know in the encampments of Israel, they had the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle in the middle of the encampment. And then the twelve tribes, when they would camp, would position themselves around the tabernacle by a very specific order. And it was always Dan, the tribe of Dan, that would camp on the north side. So Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 14.3 that God sits in the sides of the north and he judges. And what is Dan? Dan means, if you look it up, it means judgment. And so if we're going to turn northward, if we will seek His judgment, you will see His mercy. Amen. So when you want to get out of the stuck place, you say within yourself, I have to immerse myself in the judgments of God. It's one thing when people judge us. It's another thing Paul said, it's a small thing if you judge me. He said, I don't even judge myself. So we're not talking about the judgment of man. The judgment of man is of very limited, if any, value. You have all those people saying, you know what's wrong with you? I got a feeling you're going to tell me. <laughs> you know? No, we're not talking about the judgments of man. We're talking about the judgments of God. And if we turn to God's judgment as New Testament believers, we are confronted with Calvary. Because 1 Peter 2.24 says God put upon Jesus all the sins of the world. Sometimes when you're suffering, you think, have I done something wrong? Is God punishing me? Is there something wrong with me? And then we turn to God's judgment. And as New Testament believers, we see the cross. And we remember that God poured all of His wrath out upon Jesus Amen. upon the cross. Amen. And if God poured all of His wrath out upon Jesus upon the cross, where is the scripture that says that He kept a bucket full just so He could make your life miserable for some inscrutable reason that the theologian will suggest that it's really God sticking it to us when we're, when we're suffering. And I just challenge us with that thinking. What portion of the wrath of God was not poured out upon Jesus upon the cross? Theologians will tell us that God reserved some of His wrath to pour out upon us to teach us something or to um, love us in some strange way we can't relate to. But yet He said, if you ask for bread, will I give you a stone? If you ask for fish, will I give you a scorpion? But yet teachers today, because they don't understand human suffering and they want to come up with answers, they somehow claim that God didn't mean it when He said that He came, that Jesus came that we might have life and have life more abundantly. 
And so we get into all this contaminated thinking that, yeah, God says a lot of things, but that doesn't mean I'm going to experience it. Mm-hmm. But yet he said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we do with our faith what others have done with their faith, we're going to see the same results. What's involved? Is it just something that's just going to randomly, by God's sovereignty, come up upon us? No. We're going to walk into what we've been waiting for. In other words, you participate in your own deliverance. All of the wrath of God against sin was poured out upon Jesus. And if you and I are going to exit the rough place, how's it going in your family? It's pretty rough. How about your kids? They're really going through it. How about your finances? It's kind of rough right now, Brother Walden. I'm here to tell you that God sent me here to say to you, you've dwelt in that mountain long enough. You're coming out of the rough place. But you're going to come out on your feet. Hello? You're going to walk out of the rough place into a place of God's favor where you will know what it is to see everything you say and do become as effective as if God said it or did it. And to experience the favor of God that has nothing to do with how spiritual you are, but everything to do with how good He is. You say, but Brother Walter, maybe I need to repent. That's right. We all need to repent. But Romans 2, 4, and 5 says it is the goodness of God that leads us to repent. The goodness of God. He pours out, is it not saying where, where sin abounds? Grace does much more about God's empowering presence. God is pouring out His unmerited favor. You don't deserve this, but I'm going to be good to you anyway. I'm going to be so good to you that you will be unable to rebel against me. I'm going to be so good to you and so sweet to you. I'm going to bless you so much that you can't help but fall on your knees and declare that I am God. It's the goodness of God. So if we're going to exit the rough place by turning into God's judgments, we have to find ourselves confronted with the cross and the fact that Jesus paid the price for every sin that Satan might accuse us regarding uh, in order to keep us in the rough place of suffering and difficulty. And how did they get out of the rough place? Did God take them and just wave His hand over them and suddenly they were no longer in Mount Seir, but they were on the other side of the Jordan? It didn't work that way. They walked out. Amen. Listen, folks, we're walking into what we've been waiting for. What have you been waiting for God to do? God says you can walk into what you've been waiting for. And Galatians 5.25 confirms this. It says, if we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. I spent six months studying that word walk in the Bible, trying to understand what it meant. What does it mean? We live in the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit. And one day God just dropped it on me. It's so simple. What does it mean to walk? It means to progress by steps. In other words, something that's doable in your life. Something that's reproducible. Something that's within your grasp. Something that you're capable of. It's what we said earlier. Do what you can with what you have and stick with it. You walk yourself out of your own captivity. We tend to sit in our circumstance waiting vainly for something to get better. But God didn't translate the children of Israel from Mount Seir. They walked out on their feet just like Enoch. In uh, Genesis 5.24 it said Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And that's an interesting word walk. It meant, if you look it up it means to haunt. To haunt. H-A-U-N-T. In other words your, your old familiar haunts. There may be somewhere around town when you were young you used to love to hang out. Uh, it's a haunt or a hangout. That means that uh, like my little son, my oldest son, when he was this size and wearing his red couple of boots and his overalls, he'd follow me around and he'd be tugging on my pant leg. Daddy, 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 daddy. And I'd reach down and I'd grab him by the straps of those overalls and I'd hold him up. I said, why don't you just come with me today, boy? 
and he would go with me to the office and he would spend he was going to spend the day with daddy because he wasn't taking no for an answer see the person that haunts God the person that pursues God where pursuing after God is not an occasional visitation but an abiding habitation that you're walking in the rarefied atmosphere of His presence, not just when we come into the corporate gathering and the amplification of His presence we feel here, but it's something you're walking in every single day when you're pumping your gas and buying your groceries and working on the job and you step into that place where you work and you say, I take authority over everything and everybody that's in this place for the glory of God the Father and the angels of heaven are attending you. See, God did not arbitrarily translate Enoch to heaven without Enoch's cooperation. Enoch, the scripture says by faith, Hebrew says by faith Enoch was translated. We tend to think that one day God's just going to push the big red button and everybody that signs a decision card is going to suddenly and miraculously vanish and appear in the heavens. I got news for you. If it's the scripture says whatever's not of faith is sin. That's right. That without faith it's impossible to please God. And if whatever the rapture of the saints, the uh, redemption of the purchased possession, the adjudication of uh, uh, the, the saints, uh, putting on immortality, the manifestation of the sons of God, whatever you want to call it, pre, mid, pan, <laughs> if it's not by faith, then it's not going to please God. That's right. Enoch walked into his immortality by a transaction of faith. We're going to walk into what God has for us in this day. It's not going to be something that's going to be dropped on us like pixie dust. We're going to stand up as the people of God. And we're going to begin to listen to apostles' doctrine. And we're going to walk in fellowship. And, I, and, and we're going to give up this idea of teeth, grit, and love. I'm going to love you if it kills me and you both. And we're going to cut covenant, the covenant of relationship. And we're going to begin to intercede and pray together. And we're going to walk ourselves into the outpouring of God that has been promised for us corporately and that has been promised for us individually. And your whole life will be upended by the outpouring of God's blessing upon you in such a way that those around you that think they know you will not understand what they'll say. Who are you that God has been so good to you? Because you walk into what others are waiting for. Yes, God. Do it, God. The man at the pool of Bethesda Walked into his healing. Now get this picture. At the pool of Bethesda, they waited for the angel to come down once a year. He troubled the water. First one in got healed. Everybody else just got wet. Isn't that what happens with revival? Come on now. You know, Frank Parham, who was a Journalist, He chronicled the Azusa Street Revival. He said when they put the sign Apostolic Faith Mission over the building, the revival was over. By the time we hear about it, you can't get to Pensacola fast enough. By the time you get it, you, you just, you get to hear the testimonies about how good it was, but the first one in gets the extract. Everybody else just gets the doctrine, the testimony. Now, I like the doctrine and I like the testimony. I've spent 30 years studying and immersing myself in a testimony of revival. But I want the original extract. How about you? Yes, yes. And so here they were. We could read in John 5. It said there were a multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, and waiting. Doesn't that describe some of what we've seen in the church? And if we needed any more help to figure it out, it said they were reclining upon the five porches. What does that speak to you about? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, five-fold ministry, and the people of God are just there waiting. Blind, halt, withered, and waiting. Jesus. Waiting for a move of God. Waiting for the angel to come. And Jesus himself walks up to this guy. And he'd been there 38 years. 
And the number 38, if you study it, it means conformity with that which has been rejected. <coughs> and he looks at this guy, he says, do you even want to get better? What an insult. And the man looked at Jesus, and obviously, Jesus wasn't very impressive, because he didn't even ask Jesus to hang around just in case the angel showed up. He said, sir, I have no man. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Waiting on a move, overlooking a visitation. Oh, my goodness. And let's look and see what Jesus said to him. So again, John 5, 5 through 9. The certain man was there, and he had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. And when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been there a long time in that case, he'd been encamped around his personal Mount Seer. He'd been in the rough place. How about you? And he said, will you be made whole? Do you even want to get better? And the impotent man, how many of you feel impotent? Impotent to see your children come to Christ. Impotent to see your marriage brought out of fracture. Impotent to see your life come out of that place of restriction and limitation. And he says, do you want to be made whole? And the man said, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled. So he was looking at man... And he was waiting on an event but overlooking a habitation, a visitation of God that was being offered to him in the overture that Jesus was bringing to him at that moment. He said, I have no man to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Everybody else is getting blessed but me. That doesn't work for me. How about you? I'm not very good at waiting in line. <laughs> And Jesus said this. Listen to what he told him. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. What was he saying to him? He was saying, son, you can walk into what you've been waiting for. You don't need to be in the company of the blind, halt, withered, and waiting. Just waiting on revival to hit. Just waiting on... Some, no, you can... Walk. Am I saying revival doesn't come? You better believe it comes. Yeah. It comes like a tsunami. It comes like a tidal wave of glory. There is coming into this part of the United States a great awakening that's going to turn back the tide of secularism for a hundred years. Yeah. And it's going to happen in your lifetime. Wow. But let me tell you something. It's not going to come upon a bunch of people that are willing to be in the company of the blind hawk with and waiting and there are going to be those that are going to stand up as a company of heaven and walk into what they've been waiting for that it might detonate the favor of God in their personal life and break out in their communities and sweep over their churches and they will become known as that glorified company of believers that the prophet referred to he said deliverers are going to come out of Zion you know what Zion means? look it up, it means the parched place Oh, it's dry, bro. It's dry. <laughs> Some deliverers are going to stand up and walk yourself out of the dry place and see in the company of all those around you suddenly impacted. Those that have the simple faith of the, of the lepers that said, why sit we here till we die? Let's abandon ourselves. Let's hurl ourselves over the precipice of His purpose. I had a dream one night of I was in an airplane and the pilots jettisoned the fuel, put on parachutes and dove out of the plane. And I picked up the last remaining parachute and I threw it out after them. <laughs> and then I, I jumped out of the plane with no parachute and I had just this thrill in my spirit knowing I was going to land on my feet and walk in the glory. Amen. And I wrote an article called Free Fall to Your Father. Amen. What have you got to lose? Amen. <laughs> Amen. He said, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately, immediately went when the man did what Jesus told him to do. Uh -huh. And maybe he was paralytic, but somehow down on the inside of him, he hurled his volition. He hurled himself against the impediment that was holding him. And when he did that, his will was met by the miracle working power of God and he stepped into his miracle and he stood up and he walked. 
and he took up his bed and he left that place with a testimony because he accepted the visitation of God upon his life. He walked into what he was waiting for. And let me tell you something. What are you waiting for? You could walk into what you've been waiting for. How do I do that, Brother Walden? Do what you see the Father do. Have no opinion about the consequences. Hello. <laughs> Relinquish the outcome and be willing to make the chaos decision. And I get, I get that if you're struggling, you, you can listen to me say those words and says that doesn't make any sense. I understand that. If it made sense, you wouldn't be where you are. Because on the other side of obedience, there's always a reward. Amen. But you're going to have to jettison your thinking and be willing, like I say, to charge hell with a water pistol. <laughs> be willing to be one of the foxes that Samson tied their tails together, set them on fire, sent them through the enemy's barley fields. Be willing to make those radical choices. And I'm not just talking about spiritual choices. I'm talking about stepping into your dreams. We're trying to use faith on coping strategies. Trying to exercise faith to survive. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means believing God for the impossible. There's only, if, if you're believing for the possible, that is so boring to God and He will so absolutely pick you up and throw you into the deep end <laughs> because He's a God of adventure. I've had God many times. I'd stand up to believe God for something. He says, that's boring. We've already done that. Let's go for something that's just absolutely improbable, uh, impossible and obscene to the logical mind. Yep. Let's step out and believe God to do in your community, to do in your life, to do in your children, to do in your finances, to do in your health what it just totally and utterly impossible and complete fantasy to take place. And he steps in and he substantiates your hopes and causes them to come to pass and you hold the truth of it in your hand and you see that God came through for you because you were willing to walk into what others are only content to wait for. Amen. When the Israelites left Mount Seir, the next place they went was the Jordan. And the Jordan means the going down place. Isaiah 57 says that God inhabits the high and lofty place with the person that is of a contrite and a humble spirit. You cannot be offended and humble at the same time. You have to be willing to forgive, release, and bless even the undeserving, even the unrepentant. Not because it sets them free, but because it sets you free. Because you are so much more than what those that have brought pressure against you think you are. And if you're ever going to get free, you have to be willing to forgive, release, and bless. I remember one time I, I had somebody very motivated to make my life difficult and they spent many, many months and their whole focus in life was to see how difficult they could make it for Russ Walden. And uh, I said, God, I like, remember when uh, Abraham sent Lot away from him? I, I, I said, God, occupy that person elsewhere. And the Lord said, do you mind if I bless them away from you? I had to think about that a minute. I want God to bless him with a brick. <laughs> and I hesitated probably longer than I should have. And I said, okay, whatever it takes, one of us needs some relief. And that person won a multi-million dollar legal settlement. And from that day till this, they have been hounded by every second cousin three times removed. <laughs> And they have had no time to put their attention upon Russ Walden. Whatever it takes. So I get when you say they don't deserve blessing. But you can never experience the mercy in your life that you're not willing to accord the most obnoxious person who's harmed you, wounded you, set you aside and done you dirty. See, you can only receive the grace of God. That when God looks at you, He sees the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. 
but you only experience the dividends of that to the degree that you're willing to look at the person that makes your life most difficult or has deeply wounded you in the past and to say, I forgive, I release them, I bless them. And in so doing, you literally catapult yourself into a place of favor in God that is beyond anything, beyond any metric you currently have the capacity to measure in every area of your life. You say, sounds good. Now you've got to understand, we don't, the Bible says, tell what you've seen and heard. We never preach what we don't walk in. I'm here to tell you we know what it is to see everything we say and do become as effective as if God said it or did it. And it's reproducible. And it's a free gift. And it's all about deciding I'm going to stand up and shake myself. And I'm going to walk into what I've been waiting for. And it doesn't matter if nobody goes with me. It has to do with go low. We have to walk in humility. Why? Because James 4, 6 says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. That word resist means God sets His forces in array against the proud. But He gives grace to the humble. Just to simply say, Jesus, you just tell me what to do. I don't know what He wants me to do. Don't worry, He has some really loud speakers. He will turn up the volume. (laughs) Because He holds Himself responsible. To know, to, for you to know, to make sure you know what he has to say. He has a ways and means committee to get your attention. Amen. And when you know you've heard from heaven, then you do what you see the Father do, even if it doesn't make sense. Even if everybody around you says you're out of your mind. Even people that love you, but don't have the same faith that you have, and they're afraid for you and trying to tell you not to. And God says, obey God. Step out. Do what you see the Father do. Have no opinion about the consequences. Refuse to listen to your critics. Relinquish the outcome. And step into that place where it will be like the Scripture says, then we were like those that dreamed. (laughs) For the glory and the manifest reality of heaven taking place in your life. So you have to do something. Luke 17, 20 and 21. He was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come. You ever demand something of God? I paid my dues. I tithe. I've done this. I've done that. I've put up with this. And I've put up with that. Demanding. That's our little inner Pharisee. We've all got one. You're laughing because you know him. You yeah. know that guy. <laughs> Demand- when the kingdom should come, just look what he said. The kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. The kingdom of God does not come in the dynamic that was represented by the blind, halt, withered, and waiting. Sitting in the arrogance of their impotence, demanding God must do something. And Jesus says, rise, take up your bed and walk. Walk into what you've been waiting for. The Pharisees were wanting to know what God was going to do. Many people approach the prophetic that way. They want to know what God is going to do in their life. The Pharisees were demanding. They were demanding of God. They felt they were in a position by their religious works to demand something from God. They felt they had paid their dues. And Jesus was very patient. And he said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for the kingdom of God is within you. So all of the resources of heaven that are going to completely transform your life are right there inside of you. In the glory. Paul said that it's in Christ in you that is the hope of glory. And Philippians 4.19 says he meets all of your needs out of the riches of His glory and the glories in you. It's not something outside of you. Every deliverance, every miracle, every answer to prayer is in you, in embryo, in the glory. And Jesus said, when they're trying to tell you, lo here, 
or low there to create outward dependence on religious infrastructure or institution. He said, don't follow that. The kingdom of God, whatever it was he had in his mind when he used that term, he said, whatever the kingdom of God is, whatever Jesus thinks the kingdom is, it's on the inside of you in the glory. Christ in you is your hope of glory. Christ in someone else. Christ in the institutions of the church. Christ in uh, apprehending some uh, far off doctrine or new book that's going around. But that's not your answer. It's something that's on the inside of you and you can have the IQ of a turnip and you can walk yourself into breakthrough if you'll know that He has sown Himself into you in such a manner that you'll walk through life like John Lake said when he wrote the book Spiritual Hunger and the God Man. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, it's on the inside of you. We have to do something. John 5.19 was where Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. The man at the pool of Bethesda was waiting for something, but Jesus gave him an invitation. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. He said, the person that is born again is like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from and you don't know where it's going. I got news for you. It's not only the people that are watching the person born of the Spirit. I just don't get her. What is she doing? You never know. Where is she coming from? Where is she going? No. The person, if you are that person that is born of the Spirit, you don't know where you're coming from. That's right. You don't know where you're going. It's okay. Have enough faith to be clueless. Yeah. (laughs) Abraham said he went out, he he knew not where. And it said he was rich, he was very rich. And goods and gold and, and asses and he asses and she asses and maids and men servants. And when, when I thought God would rebuke Abraham, God just dumped the whole dump truck of blessing upon him beyond anything he'd ever had. It offended my inner Pharisee. <laughs> because he was willing to be clueless and to take 318 people and their families with him when he did it. Come on, yeah. Let's do it. God wants you to walk into what you've been waiting for he wants you to talk like he talks what are we going to do we're going to do what God would do if he was in our position what would he do go out and talk to your storm go out and talk to your problem if you've got a problem spouse Wait till they're out of the house. Go stick your face in their pillow and pray in strong tones for 30 minutes. Amen. Amen. They'll go to bed and let me tell you something. God will, God will be talking to them. God has a ways and means committee. Amen. I remember the lady that, that wrote in. She said, I need you to pray for me. I'm going tomorrow to the final legal proceeding that I've been judged and held responsible for a half million dollar property and they're imposing the debt upon me, they're taking the property, I'm losing my home, please pray for me. And I was so frustrated, I wish she'd have got with me before six hours before the proceeding. And God said, you just pray for her anyway. And I prayed the prayer of faith over that lady and I didn't feel like I had anything. All my faith ran out of my feet. I I haven't got enough of a pastor in me that I was hurting for that lady. And hoping against hope, she came back and she said, they forgave the debt and gave me the property. I guess she was choosing to walk into what she was waiting for. Stand up with me. Thank you. Thank you, God. Just bow your heads with me. The Father says, I'm I'm inviting you to walk 
toward what you've been waiting for. I'm inviting you to open your spiritual ears. He said, if you'll open your spiritual ears, I'll turn up the volume and I'll cause you to know that you know that you know what I'm expecting of you. I will hold myself responsible to speak if you will hold yourself accountable to hear. Yes, Lord. And I will take you out of fracture. I will mend your marriage. I will heal your body. I will recover your children from the grips of the enemy. I will break the spirit of poverty that's gripped your life. I will bring you from limitation to limitlessness. I will cause you to know what it is to see everything you say and do to be as effective as if God said it or did it. I will release into you an experience that will better the imagination. And those around you that think they know what the metric of God's blessing is will not have the capacity to embrace the scope of what I'm prepared to do in your life. And so I break off of you now limitation. I break off of you now the fear. I break off of you now that concern about what people think and the demands of the rational mind that says I have to have an explanation before I'll obey and I release upon you the spirit of obedience that says I will obey God. I'm willing to walk on the water. I'm willing to vault over the rail. I'm willing to refuse to listen to my critics. Embrace my dream and step out into what God has promised me and I break off every limiting spirit right now in the name of Jesus and every illegitimate word curse that says you can't you won't and it will never because you will God says I'm with you be of good courage I allow me to be those spirits that causes your feet to fly towards my will and as you step out and embrace what I promise you says the Father you'll be turned into another man you'll be turned into another woman and people will look at you and be unable to find the identifying marks of all that pain and suffering and the difficulty because the glory of my cross will eclipse all of the scars and all of the wounding that you've gone through and I will heal your land and I will deliver you and I will bless everything that you put your head to and you will be a child of my favor beyond any comprehension of mortal man to measure, says the Father, even this day. Is that your promise? Yes. Amen. 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 Amen.